Hey everyone, it's Sirsha, and today we have a special guest. Caddy is here on my lap. Um, I just, I just love when my cats join me for videos. I miss having my desk set up where they would walk across the camera. But they really like when I'm in this cozy chair, so I should use it more often. So today we are going to look at walking, and then the, uh, what do you call it? It's not a subtitle. Um, oh my gosh. What are words? Anyway, the rest of the title is One Step at a Time. And this is by Erling Kaga. I'm sorry to all of Norway uh, for the pronunciation. So, you might remember, like, two years ago, when I talked about this book, Silence in the Age of Noise. I really liked this one, and I picked it because its, it's cover is just, like, beautiful. Look at the, the sparkly sparkles and the pretty picture and it's just very like minimalist. Um, and I'm not a minimalist, I'm definitely like a maximalist in a lot of ways and I love clutter core and all that, but I do love simplistic beautifully designed covers so I really like the photo and that it goes all the way across the book. And the photos in this book are so crisp. Um, I'll show you in a second, but first, let me tell you, this was published in 2018 um, in Norwegian, and it was translated in 2019 into English. So I'll just read you the back. It says, why do we walk? Where do we walk from? What is our destination? Placing one foot in front of the other and embarking on the journey of discovery are activities intrinsic to our nature. But as universal as walking is, each of us will experience it differently. For renowned explorer Erling Kaga, walking is a natural accompaniment to creativity, the occasion for the unspoken dialogue of thinking. Walking is also the antidote to the speed at which we conduct our lives, to our insistence on rushing, on doing everything in a precipitous manner. Walking is among the most radical things we can do. Um, you may know how much I like walking. I feel like I've cut my head off here and I don't know how to... Am I in this video? Am I part of it? Whatever, I don't need to be. But, um, I through hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018, and that was over 2,000 miles of walking across six months and a million mountains. So, I'm a big, big fan of walking. I took so many walks. Um, when I was living in Scotland last year and lockdown happened, and there was nothing that we could do aside from walk, so I took some really beautiful walks around the city. And I'm sorry, she's just so cute right now, I can't stand it. She's so small and furry, and just like curled up in a perfect little circle on my lap. Oh, I love my babies. Um, anyway, walking is such a good way to focus your brain, or to unfocus your brain, to move slower and to see things around you in a way that you wouldn't normally see them because you know when we drive we don't notice almost anything i've i've noticed this lately it's hard to go walking here now because it's about a thousand degrees in florida um and it makes me want to scream as soon as i go out the door but if i do walk around an area that i typically drive around like even just in my neighborhood i see details in people's landscaping in their houses that I love and that I don't notice when I'm driving. So, yeah, you just, you, when you move slower, you see so much more. Um, and so during lockdown, I had this thing where I would, like, I had a routine, a very solid routine, and it was great. And part of that routine was every single day I would walk five miles, and I would try to pick, like, a different five-mile loop to do in the city, and, um, and that way I would explore different areas, and I'd figure out, like, where can I go that equals five miles to get back to my flat? Um, yeah. It was a good time. Not as many walks to be had here, unfortunately. Uh, so I'll read this part of the dedication. He puts a little quote in here that I just love. It says, you're walking and you don't always realize it, but you're always falling. With each step you fall forward slightly and then catch yourself from falling. And that's by Laurie Anderson, Walking and Falling. 
And isn't that so true? I mean, technically, scientifically speaking, that's what's happening when we're walking. And I freak myself out sometimes and think about how do my legs know to go? Like, what neurological um, signals am I sending to my body to make it move? Like, I'm turning pages right now, but I'm not aware of telling my fingers to do that. Anyway, I'll start freaking out um, if I think too hard. What does that say? Oh, okay. She's, little, she's snoring. Um, so I'll read you some of the bits that stood out to me in here. It is a truth universally acknowledged that one saves time traveling only two hours from one point to another instead of spending eight hours on the same journey. While this holds up mathematically, my experience is the opposite. Time passes more quickly when I increase the speed of travel. My speed and time accelerate in parallel. It is as if the duration of a single hour becomes less than a clock hour. When I am in a rush, I hardly pay attention to anything at all. Um, and then he goes on to say, when you're in a car driving towards a mountain with small pools, slopes, rocks, moss, and trees zooming past on all sides, life is curtailed. It gets shorter. You don't notice the wind, the smells, the weather, nor the shifting light. Your feet don't get sore. Everything becomes one big blur. Um, and then skipping a little bit. This is precisely the secret held by all those who go by foot. Life is prolonged when you walk. Walking expands time rather than collapses it. I love that so much. Um, because when I was through hiking, I, I mean, I had days where I was so just bored with how slowly I was progressing because you were snoring so loud. I love you so much. I love you so much. My baby girl. Um, I, like, especially in parts of the trail where it was a lot of, like, rock scrambling and all that. It's it's almost never flat, let's be honest, right? It's almost never a flat, easy path. It's not a walk in the woods. It is constantly climbing and descending mountains. Um, so I felt like I was moving so slowly. I was like this snail making my way from Georgia to Maine. But because I was going so slow, I could, I could notice things that in my life I'd never stopped and, and taken the time to notice. And I miss it a lot. I miss it because it really, um, it really makes you think about what's important and yeah. Yeah. I'll just say that. I can just go on and on about things, as you know. Um, uh, okay, so he's talking about things like, he says these things walking across a field, up a mountain, and along a cliff, or into the forest to find a spot for making a campfire, are most pleasurable precisely when we no longer need to do them. The feet that were developed to help humankind survive, and still are vital for survival in a major part of the world, have become tools for finding the perfect spot on the beach, or for taking a detour home, or tiptoeing into the bedroom, or walking away from our problems. Um, and so a lot of this made me think about my through hike, because obviously that's when I've done the most walking in my life. And the way he says, like, doing these things, like finding a, a spot to make a campfire, um, walking up a mountain, along a cliff, they're most pleasurable when we don't have to, like, we don't have to do them. Um, because, oh, cat is running, there's a cat running outside. Because when we have to do these things out of the need to survive, like, let's think about, let's think about for a minute, like, cavemen. Do you think they were, uh, enjoying when they had to go for a long walk to hunt for food so that they wouldn't die really soon? Probably not. That was not like, they didn't go on like a romantic amble through the fields with their partner. They were, um, trying to hunt things so that they could feed their partner so they wouldn't die. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's hard when you're walking, when you're doing like a through hike and you're walking thousands of miles, you can, you can kind of stop enjoying it sometimes because it feels like a task that you have to do. And then 
when you finish a through hike and then you, you go back and do like a day hike, it's so enjoyable because you don't have to find a place to camp, you don't have to find a place to hang your food, you don't have to do your business in the woods. Um, but those, you know, those all become fond memories once we look back at them, but in the moment it, it's a necessity. I just thought that was interesting. According to research, humans move about differently after watching a movie depending on whether the movie was sad or funny. This is apparent in other situations as well. When I see people before they head out on a walk through the forest, in the mountains, or in a park, and then happen to see them again as they head home, I can tell that they have changed. This change is even more obvious to me than the change after going to the cinema. Cinema? Cinema. If people are exhausted after their working day when heading out for a hike, they are exhausted in a completely different way upon their return. Their eyes may be glowing, their step has a spring to it, and their smiles are more relaxed. Um, yeah, I mean, this is obvious. It is wonderful to be exhausted in a physical, I've had a great adventure way, and awful to be exhausted in a mental, I had to answer a bunch of annoying emails and deal with stupid meetings all day way. Um, So I feel if I had to work some 9 to 5 office job, getting away for a walk in the mountains would be the greatest thing in the world. And the Appalachian Trail was originally um, designed to be for people to get away from the cities and go for day hikes and things like that, but then people started walking it from beginning to end. That's why it, it goes up and down every single mountain and it doesn't go around them because it wasn't meant to be hiked all the way through like that. It was meant to be, of course it's going to go up to the top of mountains because then people on their day hikes can go and see the view and all that. But crazy people like me decided to walk the whole thing. I don't have too many for this. This is a really short book, and like I, as I felt with the other one, Silence, um, it's it's good to just read in one sitting, and you feel kind of relaxed. And there's a certain way that he writes that's very meditative and beautiful, um, but also kind of scientific and straightforward at the same time. It's hard to explain, but it's just it's just one of those nice reading experiences, if you will. I know there are people who are able to think clearly and run at the same time, but I prefer a slower speed. When I walk, my thoughts are set free. My blood circulates, and if I choose a faster pace, my body takes in more oxygen. My head clears. If my phone rings while I am sitting down, I like to stand up and pace about as I speak. My memory, concentration, and mood improve after only a few steps. If you are in a bad mood, go for a walk, was Hippocrates' advice. And if you are still in a bad mood, go for another walk. Context is reflected in our language. Motion and emotion. Move and moved. I love that because a lot of people who love running, they they say that it's like really good for their mental health and they can clear their head. When I'm running, and I've done quite a bit of running, all I feel is pain and thoughts about I'm running, I'm running, I don't really want to be doing this, my body doesn't enjoy this, but when I'm walking, it's easy and I can think about anything at all, um, or I can notice things around me. I just, I much prefer a hike to a run, um, but whatever works for you, whatever kind of way that you get out there physically and, and use, um, use motion to help your mental health, by all means, go for it. I wish I could enjoy running more. I did a few half marathons, and then I was going to do uh, the Edinburgh Marathon last year. Of course, it was cancelled, and it's actually happening this weekend, the virtual version of it. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm still in it, but I'm obviously I'm not going to run it because I haven't trained in months. Um, yeah, just much prefer walking. My 
Floyd is completely asleep, but I can't move her. She's so precious. Okay. It's possible to leave behind a whole slew of habits when you go for a long hike. There is pleasure in considering what you actually need, in having to decide between the things that you must bring along and those that you only want to bring because they might constitute a comfort. I have the impression that most people underestimate the amount of time that they would be able to make do with nothing more than a sleeping bag, an extra warm jacket, a small pan, a stove, matches, and enough food. If you say it's impossible to survive with so little, and I say that it is possible, we are both probably right. A lot of people wouldn't want to take on something like a through hike or like this man who walked to the North Pole, walked to the South Pole, and climbed Mount Everest. Um, I'm so jealous. Everest is one of my dreams. And yeah. so yeah, a lot of people wouldn't be into that. Um, they'd say, why, like, why in the world would you do that to yourself? But there are those of us who enjoy this lack of having everything for a while. And I think he, I'm gonna talk about that, yeah, right here. Uh, back at home, returned to civilization, daily life takes over with surprising speed. Pleasures become more complicated, often less intense and more to be expected. Over the course of a few days, grand sensations such as feeling full or warm, sleeping well, or seeing another human being are taken for granted. We have a saying in Norwegian, much wants more, and that's exactly how it is. I try with varying degrees of success to continue enjoying small things, to value the fact that I am home in my living room, that I can participate in my own family life, and to be happy about those things that I missed while I was away. But the pleasure of savoring a single raisin seems absurd when I have an entire packet of raisins in a cupboard in my kitchen and the fridge is full of other good food. As I mentioned earlier, I know that a single piece of chocolate tastes better than an entire bar, but I still, I still eat the entire bar. Um, this is a perfect description of what it feels like when you spend a long time out- No! Suddenly she just decides sometimes that she wants to jump up and walk away and go out into the catio, and that's okay, but I'm sad. Um, right, so when you're, when you're walking for a very long time and- or say you're on a long hiking, backpacking trip, and everything is about, um, just the word when you don't you don't have everything it's about oh my god what mm, I don't know I can't remember the word but like making do with with very little and things things such as feeling cold all the time and being sore and not having a bed to sleep in it becomes incredibly exciting when you when you feel warm like I, I can't even explain how transcendent it felt those days when I thought I would never feel warm again I, I truly thought I was going to be cold for the rest of my life I wouldn't feel warmth and I would never be dry again just from being soaked in the rain and then sleeping in freezing cold when you finally feel comfort again it is this otherworldly experience, but it only takes a few days for you to forget how harsh everything was before and to, to start taking everything for granted again. Um, you know, I lived on granola bars and ramen for so long, so going into town and getting a real meal was so just absolutely wild. Um, getting something like a smoothie blew my mind, but now having lived back in society for so long, a smoothie's not that exciting. I do still, some of it lingers a little bit, like I feel very grateful for my bed and comfort sometimes, um, to the point where it almost scares me to leave it, to leave comfort and go on, say like go on another hike. Um, that's more than a couple days, you know, because now I feel like I've done my time being really, really uncomfortable and I just, I don't ever want to take it for granted, the feeling of warmth and comfort. Um, 
Okay, what is this? We seek out such dangers because the experience of intense situations and our ability to overcome them feels like a confirmation of our own vitality. A few dozen seconds stretch out like an eternity. Only the present moment matters when you are thirsty and happen upon a stream, or are hanging from a cliff, or sit perched on a rock studying the shifting clouds. The present moment and eternity are not necessarily opposites. Time ceases, and both can be experienced at once. Um, and I love this. Here's an example of how crisp the photos are in this book to be printed on paper like this and just look so absolutely crisp. The colors are gorgeous. I uh, really love the printing and construction of these books. Um, so, yeah, one of my favorite things about hiking is that only the present moment matters. And this is, this is more true for backpacking than, than just having a day hike because you can be pretty comfortable with a day hike. But backpacking, you're, you're going to deal with a lot of discomfort and pain and, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, and so sometimes there are moments where your survival really does depend on what you do in the next second. And I, I ran out of water once or twice on the trail. And I learned what it felt like to be very scared about not having water and to have to drink one sip and know that it might be a few hours before I can get more water and I have to be really careful. Um, not smart of me, I don't... That I think that was just two days where I was lazy and, and didn't feel like uh, filling up and filtering water. Uh, don't do that. It's not good. Um, and there were rock scrambles where if I had placed my hand or foot wrong, I would have died. And so in those moments, you're only living in the present moment. Whatever stupid stuff that you're worried about back in regular life, uh, it just goes away. And you realize that the only important thing is this moment and survival. And once you have felt that, then I think like self-actualization and the what we in modern society think of as the point of life becomes more clear because you know, back in caveman days, again, there, was, there wasn't there was time to have thoughts of self-actualization. It was just survival, survival, survival. But now we get to go on these walks and, you know, by choice and think, think about ourselves and our place in the universe and what life means and what, what just what we're all a part of. And I think that's really wonderful that uh, we have that ability that some of us do. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. And yeah, I really liked, I really liked these books, both of them, um, as a as a nice hour or so, a couple hours, maybe depending on how slow I was reading, of uh, meditation, really, and just a different way of looking at things. So definitely recommend. Uh, Here's my other kitty. Springer, you wanna say hi? Do you wanna say hi? Oh. Oh, I love you. There he is. Say hi. Say thanks for watching. See you next time. Happy reading.